God had given Jonah a very clear call. Verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So it's the 8th century BC, and at that time Assyria was the great world superpower. And Jonah was being asked to go to its capital city, Nineveh, to preach the word of God. But instead of heading northeast to Nineveh, Jonah heads in the opposite direction, west, verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, which is probably in Spain, from the presence of the Lord. So here we have a man on the run from God. He took a boat heading in the exact opposite direction from the way God wanted him to go. And verse 5, he went down into the hull of the ship to sleep. Can you see Jonah's displaying classic escapism techniques here? He, he, he's uh, trying to forget about the situation. He's running away. He's falling asleep. And the ship's captain wakes him up in the midst of the storm. Verse 6, the captain came and said to him, what do you mean? You sleeper, arise, call out to your God. When it comes to our calling as Christians today, it's actually very similar to Jonah's call. God wants us also to share the good news of salvation with those around us. But like Jonah, the church has very often run away from the call of God and so often fallen asleep on the job. So let's learn, first of all, from Jonah to wake up to the Lord's call. That's our first heading. Wake up to the Lord's call. What we see in Jonah 1 is what happens when we try to run away from God, run away from the call of God. And we see from Jonah that it's a downward spiral if we choose that path. In verse 3, he went down to Joppa. Then in the same verse, he went aboard, or more literally, he went down into it, into the ship. Verse 5, Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship. And if you look on to chapter 2, verse 6, he describes his descent into the water with these words. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Can you see it's a downward spiral, down, 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 as we try and run away from God. It's utter foolishness and it leads to disaster. And this first chapter of Jonah is really like a big warning sign to us, warning us not to reject God, not to reject God's call upon our lives. Or put it positively, it's a big encouragement to us to wake up to the call of God on us. Now, God has a call for us this morning, whoever we are. We might be a Christian, we might be a non-Christian uh, listening to this message. We're, whoever we are, God is calling us. He's speaking to us. He's calling us to himself. Did you know God is calling you, even if you're not a Christian believer? Those sailors were in desperate trouble in the storm. They tried all sorts of things to try and deal with their situation. Verse 5, they tried crying out to their pagan gods. They hurled cargo into the sea. Verse 13, they tried to row back to shore, but always to no avail. The storm got worse and worse and their situation more and more desperate. And for many, this is a picture of life, a constant striving for peace and harmony in the midst of storms. And maybe during this pandemic, you're feeling the storms of life more powerfully than ever. People will try all sorts of things to try to find rest from the burdens of life. 
work, relationships, possessions, leisure, various sorts of spiritualities and religions, but nothing seems to work, nothing seems to bring rest and peace to our souls. Well, Jesus is calling to us as we attempt all these vain things. We saw his call last week, if you listened, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, where he says, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. By the end of Jonah 1, the storm had calmed down, and the sailors, uh, in verse 16 we read, They feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Several centuries later, Jesus walked this earth, and he calmed a storm, just with a word. And the response of the men with him at the time was just the same. They feared him. Jesus calls us to put our trust in him, in him who has the power to calm the fiercest storm. And as we do that, we find that he gives us rest. Maybe you can sense that this is God's call to you right now. This is his word. Come to me and I will give you rest. If that's you this morning, God is saying to you through this chapter, don't run away from that call. Don't run away from me. But wake up to that call and come to me for rest. Now many of us are already enjoying that rest and that sense of peace that comes as we put our faith in Jesus. We've responded to God's call to come to him to find salvation for our souls. But as Christian believers God continues to call us. He continues to speak to us. And this is his call to us at the end of Matthew 28, verse 19. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, let's go and share the good news that you yourself have received. Go and share the salvation that you yourself have received. And this isn't a call for us anyway to Nineveh or some other exotic place, probably. But simply just a call to share the good news of salvation with those around us. Our friends, our family, our neighbours, anyone we come into contact with. Billy Graham was a shining example of a man who was wide awake to God's call on his life to share the good news. His life is a remarkable story of how God took uh, the son of, of a North Carolina farmer and turned him into the greatest evangelist of the last century. In his autobiography at the back, there's a list of all the missions he went on between 1947 and 1996. And in that 50 year period, Billy Graham preached to about 350 cities around the world. And that doesn't include entries which say something like Tour of India and the Far East, or tour of American cities. On one occasion, Billy Graham was offered the chance to speak the gospel to a gangster, a gangster member, uh, a gang member about Jesus Christ. And what would the great evangelist do? Would he talk to a lowly down and out like this? His immediate reply was, I'll go anywhere to talk to anyone about Christ. I'll go anywhere to talk to anyone about Christ. Can we say the same thing? Are we prepared to go anywhere to talk to anyone about the Lord Jesus Christ? Jonah wasn't. The city of Nineveh was too far out of his comfort zone. And you can understand his reluctance. The people of Nineveh have been described as the Nazi stormtroopers of the ancient world. They were the, the enemies of Israel. 
and Jonah was not prepared to share the good news of salvation with them, at least not yet. What about us? Are we willing to go outside of our comfort zone, to speak to people who are outside of our normal uh, group of people that we would mix with? And are we prepared to share the good news of salvation with them? It's easy during a pandemic like this, when we're being told to keep our distance from people, it's easy to think that the job of making disciples is put on hold for now. But it isn't. The call of God remains always. When Paul was in prison in Rome, he could have thought that God had set him aside for a time, that he no longer had to preach the gospel because he was chained up. But he didn't think like that. He continued to do everything he could to get the gospel out. He wrote letters to the churches. He spoke the gospel to the prison guard who were right there with him. What can I do and what can you do at this time to bring the good news to others? It's harder, yes, but we have more freedom and more means of communication than Paul had in prison. It's true, God's not calling us to be a great evangelist, probably, like Billy Graham or the Apostle Paul. But he is calling us all to play our part, to be his witnesses. We each have God-given gifts that God wants to use to make disciples of all nations. And God will empower us and be with us as we step out of our comfort zones for this great task. As a very practical way of putting this into practice straight away, why not respond to the post on the forum uh, about sharing a message of hope at this time, just a one minute short talk, uh, a video recording that we can put on the church YouTube channel and others can watch. It's a very simple way of using the technology we have today just to get the message of hope out there. Let's wake up to the Lord's call on us. That's the first thing. Secondly, be grateful for the Lord's discipline. Throughout this chapter and throughout the whole book of Jonah, we see that God is in control. You simply cannot run away from God. And that's good news for Jonah, because the Lord uses his sovereign power to discipline his servant. So the storm was no coincidence. Verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Verse 7, as the sailors cast lots, it's no not a chance event that the lot happened to fall upon Jonah. Verse 15, as Jonah is thrown into the sea, it's no coincidence that the, the, the storm calms down at that precise moment. And verse 17, it's not by luck that a great fish happened to be swimming past at just the right moment. We read there that the Lord appointed it. Even the pagan sailors acknowledge God's sovereign power in verse 14. They say, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And perhaps most surprisingly of all, Jonah himself, the man on the run from God, acknowledges God's sovereignty over all things. Verse 9, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Even a man on the run from God can have impeccable theology. But the point is, God uses his sovereign power to discipline his wayward servant. Jonah had gone way off track. He was going in the opposite direction from the way God wanted him to go. And God was at work to get Jonah back on the road to Nineveh, the road he wanted him on. Now, you may think the Lord's discipline is rather severe in this instance. The storm at sea, the near-death experience, it all seems pretty extreme. But God knew exactly what he was doing. Sometimes he knows that we, his people, need severe discipline 
in order to wake up and to change direction. We uh, happily recognise God's hand when we receive his blessing. But do we recognise the hand of God when we receive his discipline? We're ready to thank God for all the good things he gives us, all the blessings. But are we ready to thank God for the tough times that we all need to stay on track in the, in the Christian life? You know, what's f far more terrifying than the discipline of God is when God lets us go our own way. That is far more terrifying. We read of that in Romans chapter 1, perhaps one of the most frightening passages in the whole Bible. And we get there the phrase, as, as Paul speaks about the wickedness of human beings, we get the phrase three times, God gave them up. People turned away from God and God gave them up to their wickedness. God let them go their own way. God withdrew his hand and allowed them to plunge headlong into the most vile wickedness. God allowing us to run away from him is truly awful. We should be grateful for the discipline of God when it comes because the alternative is far worse. Susanna Wesley was an amazing Christian mother. She had 17 children, and you thought our family was big. Every day she would pray for her children, and every week she would spend time talking to each child about the Lord Jesus and discipling them. She had certain rules that she followed carefully as she raised godly children. For instance, she taught them to pray as soon as they could speak, and she would commend and reward good behaviour. But she was also clear about the need for loving discipline and correction. She sought to subdue self-will in her children. She would give them good things only when they asked politely, and she would never allow a rebellious act to go unnoticed. It's a wonder that she raised two of the greatest Christian men this country has ever seen, John and Charles Wesley. Now I tell that story not to make us feel guilty about our own inadequate parenting, but to illustrate the need for discipline. We see it in the family, but we also need that discipline from our Heavenly Father. No loving parent enjoys disciplining their children, but every loving parent knows it's necessary at times. And we are God's children if we're Christians. And our Heavenly Father knows that we need his discipline at times. Discipline is never pleasant to receive, but we know that the Lord's discipline is good for us, and it's given out of love. And so we should be grateful for it, although it's far better to be obedient in the first place. So having heard God's call to us this morning, what will we do? If you're not a Christian this morning, God is calling you, as we've seen, to put your trust in Jesus and to find rest for your soul. To find rest in the storms of life. And if you are a Christian, God is calling you and me to share this good news, this good news of salvation with others, even in uh, the pandemic we're in at the moment, especially in the pandemic we're in at the moment. Let's not be like Jonah, who heard God's call and then ran in the opposite direction and found himself being disciplined by Father God. But rather, let's be obedient children to the Father. Let's hear his word, his call, and let's follow in obedience. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you that you are a God of love. We thank you that your word to us is always good. And it's always bad for us to turn away from what you call us to do. Father, I just want to thank you that 
when we have rebelled against you, I thank you for your discipline. Although painful, I thank you that it has saved us from ruin and brought us back on track. And I pray for all of us, Lord, as we've heard your voice this morning, I pray that we would follow what you say. Lord, I pray you would help us to come to you and find rest. And then I pray you would help us to bring this good news to others. Help us in this time when we're restricted in all sorts of ways to find creative ways to keep speaking about your salvation to others. And please would you open up opportunities for us and open people's hearts to the good news that there is salvation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.